Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon sponsored review time again, and you know what that means? Not reviewing bad comics. I remind people that it's okay that people request stuff normally out of my wheelhouse. The focus of the show is still on comic books, and something like this shakes up the status quo a bit, is something new and interesting. It even allows me to look at stuff I would never normally do and come up with fresh jokes. Plus, in this case, with it being from a medium that is completely audio, it allows me to have the easiest editing job I've ever done. We're looking at an audio drama today. Audio dramas are essentially radio plays, or for the youngins and their newfangled technology who have never experienced anything from before the year 2000, which is probably like five of you. Let's be honest, my show's demographics don't normally skew below the age of 20, if that low. Most of us have been waiting our entire lives for Pokemon Go. Basically, podcasts with actors, music, and sound effects. These days, podcasts are where you normally hear them, maybe recordings of older ones from the 1930s and 40s. However, in terms of audio dramas, probably no one has been more successful than the company Big Finish, which has continued to put out Doctor Who audio dramas since 1999. Two years into that, however, the BBC's online service, known at the time as BBCI, produced a webcast audio drama themselves for Doctor Who called Death Comes to Time. And already with that, you know you're in for something with quality when it comes to the artwork on these characters. All your base are belong to us. In all seriousness, though, Death Comes to Time is pretty damn good for the most part. The highlight is Ace, my favorite classic series companion. Had the series continued on for another season or two, the plan was for Ace to go to Gallifrey and become a Time Lady, and in the story, we see her undergoing a series of trials and teachings to that effect. It's genuinely great philosophical stuff and legitimate wisdom that's shared about the nature of power, limitations, and responsibility. Pretty heavy stuff for the teenage girl who joined the Doctor armed with a bunch of handmade explosives and who once beat up a Dalek with a baseball bat. However, while Doctor Who continuity and canonicity is a lot looser than other series, it's pretty clearly non-canonical due to some stuff that happens in it. The Minister of Chance is actually one of the weaker links in the story, believe it or not. Played by Stephen Fry, he's basically very similar to the Doctor, a Time Lord with a slightly quirky personality and good fashion sense. The story also introduces this rather unnecessary idea that the Time Lords have godlike powers. And I mean true godlike powers. They can speak a word and manipulate the universe as they see fit, but deliberately keep themselves from using that power. The aspect of him that's weak is not his character, but rather his lack of resolution, and that he's just kind of shoved into the story and given a lot of importance out of nowhere, despite never having been seen before until this story. It's still good stuff, and what we do get is quality, but it feels like we walked into the middle of something else with him. And I'm glad I explained all of that to you, because none of it matters now! See, Minister of Chance was produced without BBCI, Doctor Who, or anything like that. So while it's apparently the same character, it's in a completely different setting and universe and not played by Stephen Fry, so why even have the same damn name? An actual film version of Minister of Chance was crowdfunded a couple years ago, and at the time of this video, is apparently still in pre-production. And honestly, while a lot of articles I read about this say it was critically acclaimed and well-beloved as a fantasy epic audio movie, I had never actually heard of it until now, so I basically walked into this with nothing but the story itself. So let's dig into the Minister of Chance and see, or listen to rather, what makes it apparently such a great story. It could be your 
The story begins with a prologue, one that actually got made into video form for their Kickstarter. Two nations are on the brink of war, Sejuan and Jura, and an island nation called Tanto lies between them. In the prologue, Ambassador Durian, played by 8th Doctor Paul McGann, arrives to make a peaceful offering to Tanto's king. Naturally, when it's a diplomatic meeting between two friendly nations, it's nothing but amicable and pleasant. You groveling piece of shit! Hmm, who knew Gordon Ramsay was the king? The king is adversarial the entire time, which they explain as it being part of them being a warrior society. Not that we see much evidence of that, frankly. What I mainly hear is that the king is a petulant asshole and nothing else. But, then again, he has reason to be upset. Sejuan is convinced that Jura will try to take over Tanto due to its strategic proximity to both nations, but the king is convinced that all this visit and offers of friendship from Sejuan will do is provoke them into taking such an action. And even if they did, every person in the nation is ready to take up arms against an invader. The problem, though, as the ambassador puts it, is that they have swords and Jura has guns. Oh, please, this is a fantasy story. Guns are only useful to dramatic tension where someone gets shot in the arm. Giant swords are the way to go. Just look at every Final Fantasy game ever. He reassures the king that they'll be more than happy to protect them from such an invasion, even station a garrison of troops there to keep things in line. The king isn't buying it, though, since really it's just trading an open invasion for a stealth conquest of his nation. It is just this sense of honor that the Jurans will exploit. Then we will take that chance. Alas, your majesty, we will not. The ambassador explains in no uncertain terms that if they refuse a peaceful offer of friendship, they will drop a plague on the island, wipe out the population, and then take the island anyway. So really this thing is more of a protection racket than anything else. With the king's cooperation secured, Durian departs and we enter into part one sometime later, with Tanto under occupation by the Sejuans. And naturally, being a fantasy adventure, we truly begin our story in a tavern so our heroes can pick up their first quest. You know, kill 13 rats or something. We're introduced to Kitty, a barmaid at the tavern who soon meets a strange man asking about a scientist. And both she and the bartender quickly shove him out for asking about them. It seems science of any significant kind has been outlawed in the land, and magic is now the way of things. Scientists are to be arrested as charlatans and con men. And then this. Julian Wadden. Jenny Agatha. Lauren Price. Why are the credits like this? Ambassador Durian, meanwhile, is forced to quickly arrange for a public welcoming for the leader of Szechuan to Tanto, the Witch Prime, played by Sylvester McCoy. Well, at least we can expect him to be happy about what Durian has done. You upstart little diplomat! I'll scoop out your brains and shit in your skull! What the hell is it about Paul McGann that makes all these politicians so pissed off at him all the time? Well, in this case, it seems the occupation of Tanto wasn't the Witch Prime's idea, and now Jura is screaming bloody murder at him over it. Which I'm sure Ambassador Durian has no experience with at all. One of the Witch Prime's advisors is Lord Rathen, played by Paul Darrow, aka Avon from Blake 7. Maybe he'll be able to calm the Witch Prime down a bit. Kill him. Or tragic accident, blah blah. National hero, heartfelt mourning. You get the good publicity. So he's still playing Avon, it seems. Well, hooray for us. The Witch Prime refuses to have him assassinated for fear of the scandal if the truth broke out. Instead, taking the suggestion that they promote him to governor of Tanto and ride on the coattails of his popularity. It's not a bad idea, especially since Tanto is the most likely spot for an invasion from Jura, and being governor of a tiny island means he isn't in a good position to challenge him politically. And he's surrounded by very upset citizens of the former nation that don't like him very much. And, you know, he can't start any more international incidents by threatening to exterminate an entire people. Although really, when you take away the threat of genocide, what's a diplomat supposed to do? This is why Gandhi in the Civilization games is always threatening you with nuclear weapons. Kitty meets up with a friend of hers, a former scientist named Professor Kantha. She's now in hiding, but the mysterious man arrives too, needing her to construct a looking glass for him. After looking at the specifications, she realizes that he's trying to construct a telescope, and he starts to explain what he wants it for while she builds it. As you may have guessed, the mysterious guy is the titular Minister of Chance, played by Julian Wadham from... uh... 
Exorcist the beginning? I don't know, I've never seen a single thing he's been in. He needs the telescope to examine the stars, since some sort of force is out there that can displace planets. Meanwhile, Lord Rathen meets up with Durian, and it seems the two are conspiring together. Thanks to some intel from Kitty's boss at the tavern, soldiers arrive at Cantha's place and take her prisoner, Kitty and the minister making a run for it. Kitty wants to rescue her, but as the minister continually points out, she has no plan, she has no idea where she's being held, and the best idea that Kitty can think up to rescue her is bash her way in. I mean, if we only had a wheelbarrow, that would be something. Cantha is put to work helping other scientists in developing a new missile for the Sejuans, a concept that even she points out is odd for a society that utilizes magic. But then again, they obviously had some form of science on their side, since they have rocket technology at all. I mean, you can do it with magic, but while I am new to stereotypical, it's actually rarer than what they need for rocketry. Eye of combustion. Kitty and the minister head to a temple that they had been discussing in Cantha's home, where he summons up a door in the middle of nowhere. Minister of Home Architecture. Inside is what he describes as the frost bridge between worlds, some kind of way to travel between different planets. Space spatio temporal hyperlink. What's that? No idea. Just made it up. Don't want to say magic door. Unfortunately, he arrives at the wrong destination and sets off with Kitty following in search of a friend of his referred to only as the Horseman. You think this guy is a Time Lord too? And it has to be really inconvenient for any two Time Lords who happen to choose the same profession for their name. I imagine if another guy wanted to be called the Doctor or the Minister or whatever, they'd be forced to pick whatever was next unclaimed in the list, like the Septic Tank Repairman or something. Anyway, during an escape from some, well, I want to say creatures since they growl like wolves, but they're just described in the thing as brutes. They meet a man named Sutu. Sutu was a farmer who had wandered into another mysterious door, supposedly left by the horsemen, and captured by the same people who have Kitty and the Minister. Upon returning to that door, the Minister realizes that the horseman doesn't remember how to build them properly, and sends Kitty and Sutu through it so he can close it properly. From there, they're captured by some Sejuan soldiers who had just finished massacring a village, but that's when the horseman comes into play, stopping their carriage and killing the soldiers. The horseman demands to know where the hell the minister is, threatening them if they don't explain, and of course Kitty says that he's back in the horseman's world, closing his door he left open. The two decide to head to where they were being taken anyway, thinking it might lead them to Professor Cantha. Speaking of, she finishes her work, namely sabotaging the missile so that its engine will only intake dirt and dust and jam itself up, since she refuses to work on weapons. Unfortunately, just as Kitty and Sutu arrive in stolen uniforms to rescue her, Kitty is taken prisoner by Rathen, who has also arrived. However, his interrogation of Kitty about the horse is cut short by the arrival of the minister. You're about to be attacked. How do you know? I'll be doing the attacking. Shoot him! Shoot him now! Oh, don't shoot me. Shoot Oscar. <laughs> You know, not enough heroes solve their problems by summoning Godzilla to wipe out their enemies. I wonder why that is. Anywho, with our heroes all reunited, they make their escape, though Professor Cantha has a brief chat with the minister that kind of highlights that this is really a Doctor Who story with the serial numbers filed off. You gave us all weapons, and yet you don't carry one. Why not? It triggers too far from the consequences. Unfortunately, Sutu turns out to be a member of the Sejuan Secret Service and tries to kill Kitty since he's only after the Minister and the Professor. Fortunately, however, his gun is empty so Kitty is able to knock him out. And the moral of the story is, never trust farmers! Kitty and the Minister head through another doorway because... Uh... Though hey, 45 seconds of people walking through a bog. Enjoy some of that! From there, the two enter into a world where, of course, they head to a bar for more information. The minister is looking for a woman called the Sage of the Waves who can be of help to him. Unfortunately, there seems to be some kind of religious order built around the Sage, as she's purportedly demanding that people be drowned for her. Or at least the people say as much. Meanwhile, Durian returns home to Sejua to face an investigatory committee for his actions in annexing Tanto, but the guy is so clever he manages to turn it around into suggesting that the aggressiveness of the king 
gang was through Juran influence. What's more, to prevent any further interference or threats against them, that they should set up a magic force field around Tanto to keep any of the Juran's own rocket ships from landing there. The Witch Prime has figured out that Rathen is working for Durian, and suspects that for whatever reason, Durian wants a war with Jura, and will manufacture evidence to try to start one. Then will manufacture a coup to take over as Witch Prime himself. His only option is to murder Durian, sending an assassin known as the Polichar to kill him. Fling the little shit into eternity. Time's champion, everybody! On the way to the Sage, the Minister explains that the Horseman has the means to destroy pretty much everything now, and needs to be stopped. It was the reason why he was exiled in the first place. Who? From where? Who is he? He's... dangerous. He has the power to admit that this is a Doctor Who spinoff! If he says so, we'll all get sued! Professor Cantha is rescued by a local resistance group who wants to have her become their leader. However, despite Cantha hating the Sejuan occupation and their claims about magic, she's strongly opposed to violence and therefore doesn't want to lead a revolution. Instead, the temporary leader of the resistance, named Sunflower, just suggests that she start talking, encouraging ideas about reason and logic. For instance, the Sejuans believe that some things have no actual cause. Magic is responsible. It's magic! We don't have to accept explain it. So if, say, an apple is just in the middle of a field without any tree nearby, it's assumed magic put the apple there, as opposed to someone leaving it there, or there being an apple tree out of sight that was responsible for it, etc, etc. Oh yeah? Then explain how Marvel could come about without any kind of dark magic. Kitty and the Minister reach the Sage, but she's indifferent to both the Horsemen and the religious people sacrificing people in her name. No, she's too busy gardening. More revered figures in cults and religions should take up gardening. Seems like it'd calm people down a bit. The Minister heads off to confront the Horseman, but the Sage is more confused when she learns that Kitty was spared by the Horseman. However, Kitty has no time for that, instead going off to help the Minister. The Palachar manages to get close to Durian, disguised as a reporter, but Rathen recognizes her and forces her to admit the Witch Prime sent her. However, Durian decides to use this to his advantage, bringing in the Witch Prime and claiming that the Polichar was sent by the Jurans to assassinate him. The Witch Prime can't deny this allegation without admitting his own part in the attempt, thus Durian has his excuse to start a war. This is a weird adaptation of the Three Musketeers. The Horsemen and the Minister engage in battle, and we finally realize what this is all about. Stars have been moved, and both believe that the other did it. However, Kitty runs up, now grasping the situation, and gets them to see reason. After speaking with the Horsemen about the left open door, they realize that Sutu must have been looking for it, as opposed to just stumbling upon it. Thus, they have to figure out who sent him. Meanwhile, to help support the case against Jura, Rathen manages to hijack a Juran aircraft and crash it into Tanto, making it appear as if they were beginning an incursion into their territory. The Witch Prime, of course, sees right through it and has had enough, deciding to resign his position and leave Durian to whatever the hell he's going to do. Thanks for abandoning your country right when it needs proper leadership most, Witch Prime. I'm the government. I'm the government. I'm the reason nothing works. Durian is quickly elected as the new Witch Prime, while the minister meets up with Professor Cantha, who's now going around giving lectures to crowds. Every tree has a seed. Every child has a mother. Every river has a spring. Take this message to your people. Buy Professor Cantha's books on tape now for the low, low price of $29.95. What is tape, you ask? We have no idea. Probably magic or something. Kitty, pissed off about everything that's happened, blows up the sage's protective walls that keep her apart from the world, as well as her garden, and basically tells her to stop her bullcrap and start facing things. That's not a very common therapy technique. Shut off from the world? Just blow something up! The Minister, having now been briefed about all the political machinations, realizes that Durian is not what he seems to be. That he's a being of immeasurable power masquerading as an ordinary power-hungry man. What's interesting to note, though, is that this is very similar to what happened in Death Comes to Time. A Time Lord was masquerading as a conquering general to hide what he was doing from the Time Lords. Cantha, Sunflower, and the Minister meet up with Kitty who discovers that she had actually been found by the Minister when she was younger. The Minister told the tavern owner about her, and he took her in. Because clearly there was no better place to put her. You know, surrounded by booze and drunk customers. 
Durian goes to a peace summit with the Queen of Jura aboard a boat, where our heroes proceed to try to stop whatever his plan is. Said summit is basically similar to the deal with the king. He proposes they peacefully annex Jura into Sejuan. The Queen takes it well. I spit on your offer! Do you have any more? Eh, I wouldn't take it personally, Durian. She said the exact same thing on an episode of Deal or No Deal. But like the arrangement with the King of Tanto, Durian threatens to use the ballistic missile Cantho worked on should she refuse. As the Minister goes to confront Durian, Kitty demands to know what the hell his deal is with her. He quickly says that she came from another world and he left her here. He hesitates to explain why she was left out in a field for the tavern owner. What did you leave me in the forest for? I Because you were slowing me down. Minister of Dickery. The minister enters the meeting, but Durian has absolutely no idea who the hell he is. Who in the name of mystery are you? He's the police come to tell you off for misuse of power. Only it's not you he's looking for. You magnificent bastard, I read your book! Yep, it's Lord Rathen who's responsible for all of this, proclaiming that he wants to be free to realize his potential. He launches the missile at Jura, aimed for one of its cities. Oh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, such a cliché in fantasy stories. The minister wants Durian to help him now, but the Jurin prince stabs him for all of this crap he's pulled. Our heroes make their escape from the boat as Rathen's forces storm it to take the queen prisoner. The Prime Minister of Jura calls up too, with Rathen ordering their unconditional surrender in five minutes, or he'll destroy the capital with another missile. So yeah, all around, everybody's screwed. Back with Cantha, she and Sunflower speculate that she probably didn't even work on the missile at all. It was probably just something they could use to discredit her should she start doing exactly what she's doing now with the lectures. The Minister manages to reach the old Witch Prime in a dream, demanding he come help stop Rathen and properly serve his people. But you know, appearing in people's dreams while you're half drowned. Magic is totally fake in this world, you guys. Cantha suggests to Kitty that the minister deliberately came back for her, but no time for that. Sejuan soldiers show up at the tavern to get them, but the minister rescues them. He explains that Rantha's power is not about military capability, but his own power as a, well, let's call it temporal overseer to avoid the Doctor Who connection, shall we? As I said, in Death Comes to Time, it was suggested the Time Lords had godlike powers that they refrained from using. Rantha is now beginning to exercise those powers himself, and can start killing and destroying with just a thought. What a very depressing thought. However, there are limitations. He has to know in some capacity where his target is. Like, say, the Prime Minister of Jura, whom he kills because he's on the other end of the radio talking to him. The Minister wants the others to distract Rathen through retaliation by the Juran army as well as the Tanto resistance forces, but they refuse to be self-sacrificing. Instead, they, along with the Witch Prime, who arrives to help, will commit all their forces to a full-scale assault on Rathen's island. It's still a distraction, but of a different variety than what the Minister had in mind. The Minister himself is the only one who can stop Rathen. Through a little side quest, we learn that Rathen is the half-human child of whatever species the Minister is in this story. All the power, but none of the wisdom. This is why Sejuin's real problem was that it needed Hogwarts. The assault on Rathen's base begins, and Rathen quickly starts blowing things up. Even when other Sejuans try to arrest him, he pops them like balloons. Rathen and the Minister finally confront each other. What do you want? I want what everyone else wants. A proper continuation of Blake 7, and now I have the power to do it! Using his power, Rathen manages to shoot the Minister, but it was just a trick. The Horseman arrives to distract Rathen and allows the Minister to finish him off. We're better than them. You're not. Ooh, Ooh that sound effect. Betty kicked him right in the Liberators. And so our audio drama ends with the Horseman going off to do good in the universe, Kitty and the Minister going off to do... Something, I don't know, and hopefully peace being achieved for all. Not that we ever see it. The Minister of Chance is pretty good, although I have some complaints. 
First of all, you really need to listen to Death Comes to Time in order to understand aspects of it like the minister and his kind, since otherwise the story gives absolutely no context or backstory to the minister, his abilities, where he comes from, or anything like that. Sure, he explains the principles of his abilities, but if we take this story on its own, how he knows this or how anyone else figured it out is left completely unexplained. I wasn't kidding before about this feeling like a Doctor Who story with the serial numbers filed off. It's like the Doctor lands on some planet engaged in its own affairs, and he's off on adventures to try to fix it. Kitty obviously fills in the companion role in that regard, but is kind of an annoying one. There's being inquisitive about things, and then there's constantly asking questions every step along the way, and seemingly never stopping. The sound editing in a few places is not very good, just sounding very mumbly, and I can't understand what people are saying. There are a lot of extraneous detours in the story. The stuff with Sutu may have just been there to get our heroes on the path of things. The stars being moved didn't actually contribute anything to the story. The soldier who helps Kantha is forgotten halfway through. The Sage of the Waves never does anything. And there's an entire section I didn't talk about for Kitty and the Minister on their way to Rathen's base that I really don't understand the point of, aside Aside from the revelation about Rathen being half-human. And even then, that detail affects nothing in the plot. And I just realized that in neither this nor in Death Comes to Time do they ever actually call him Minister of Chance. It's always just the Minister. Again, it's just like Doctor Who. Still, despite all that, the performances are great, the story is filled with a lot of interesting twists and turns, and the characters feel fully realized and rich. So it's definitely worth a listen, I say. Next time, we take off the headphones and put on a trucker hat! because it's time for more US-1! And somehow the comic about trucking will have even more fantastical elements in it than this. Lord Raven, General, I, I didn't see you there. I've time. come to talk to the Ambassador. Fuck off. <laughs>